Hello. Well, I'm delighted to be here, uh, particularly because it's such a fascinating intersection of subjects and such a fascinating combination of speakers that we're going to hear. There is that great quote from Gandhi that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress are judged by the way its animals are treated. Well, you could substitute the words greatness and progress for survival, and uh, the definition of animals clearly as far as this afternoon is concerned is that animals, it's not humans and animals, it's humans as part of animals. And in line with the ambitions of today, this session is going to seek to shift perspectives, to get a clearer view, maybe to map a way through. And that means sometimes abandoning traditional, often disastrous points of view, ones that have taken us to where we are, for unfamiliar and uncomfortable insights. So the panel that's been assembled, as I say, they're going to put forward to the, in the next hour and a half or so some startling ideas, observations, and experiences indeed. But there's an underpinning of reason and science to all of that. It's an impressive mix of academic, uh, academics, academe, and practice. So you'll be hearing from Professor Jenny C. Stevens, Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Northeastern University. I'm not going to give lengthy biogs because I know you can all click through on those links you've already got. From W.K. Luna, who hereafter will be referred to as Nell, who is the artist and PhD candidate. Robin Maynard, Director of Population Matters, and Dr. Emily Doolittle, composer and lead in art making in the Anthropocene at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. The way it's going to work is this. Uh, everybody will speak for roughly 10 minutes. If there is something that you would like clarified specifically about that presentation, there'll be a couple of minutes after they have spoken just to do that. But we want to keep the momentum going so that actually the real discussion happens after all four presentations and can involve everybody. So if you would kind of hold back your big thoughts, if possible. Um, but obviously, please do uh, feel free to question. I'll be up here to, to handle that, to question the speakers immediately after they do speak. So let us start straight away with um, Professor Jenny Stevens, who is a climate justice scholar and activist. Jenny. Great. Well, it's really great to be here, and thank you all for um, engaging, and thanks to Nell for inviting me, and um, great to be here. I want to um, connect and actually introduce and suggest um, quite a radical idea uh, that climate justice has the potential to be an overarching, uh, maybe not a manifesto, but a guide for our work, uh, collective work, and particularly the work in universities. Um, and I'm actually in the middle of uh, writing, finishing a book that is going to reimagine what would our universities look like if climate justice was the goal. Um, and needless to say, they would look very different than what we're doing right now. Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, and I am... Um, Based in Boston, I've been on sabbatical this year here in London and also in Dublin. Um, and I'm a science and engineering background, but I've been doing more policy and activism and social science um, recently. So what I'm proposing is a paradigm shift. And as was already talked about today, paradigm shifts are uncomfortable. We have to let go of things and be open to thinking about things differently. So what I want to suggest, when my provocation that climate justice can be our, our guiding um, uh, principle is not because climate is the most important problem. We have so many problems, um, and, but climate change is a, a very particular symptom that is overarching of a deeper problem, which is um, based on our economic system, what we're valuing, how we value things, and there's so many other crises, right? Not just climate, of injustice, of violence, of all kinds of, of ecological health, our own human health. Um, so we're really in this time of polycrisis, and it is violent. Um, it, it's sometimes, some of us for, are in quite pleasant spaces, and we may not feel the violence directly, but we read about it, and many of us have experienced the violence of it. 
And um, it's largely, and the reason we've been so ineffective is because of the concentration of wealth and power and powerful interests that want to keep things the same. Um, so I want to focus on that point. And I really want to encourage us all to bring a transformative lens. As we've talked about earlier this morning, small incremental steps don't you know, actually read, lead to a false sense of action. Um, we really need to transform things big, in a big way. So I embrace a feminist, decolonial, anti-racist lens, which is really thinking about power dynamics. What are the systems and policies and practices that are reinforcing um, problematic po power dynamics that are preventing us from doing what's good for pe people and the planet? And how can we resist those um, acknowledging that we are all part of, we are in the house, right? That we're trying to dismant dismantle or reimagine. So we're acknowledging it's not resist and reinforce, you're either on one side or the other. We're, we're always both in the middle of it all, right? We, many of us, the things we do, do reinforce um, what we want to change, but we have to also be okay with that paradox. Um, so I want to just very briefly explain what climate justice is and what climate justice is not, because it's getting leveraged in to, as mainstream climate action, which it is not. Mainstream climate action focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonizing things. Very important, but that is not sufficient, right? That, but if you have that as your goal, your approach is market mechanisms, technological innovation, and individual behavior change. Um, and this is what I call climate isolationism. When we think about the climate crisis in narrow ways, we think of it as a problem needs to be fixed and we have the technologies to fix it. And that narrow, linear, technocratic assumptions, many of us in, our, in universities are actually perpetuating this view. And it's not helpful. Um, so I suggest instead we focus on climate justice. Climate justice is about reducing human vulnerabilities, marginalization, exploitation, and the oppression, and by enhancing equity and justice. And if those are our goals, then our approach is very different. Our approach is about investing in people and communities, understanding and resisting the structures, policies, practices, and relationships that maintain those injustices, and we need to have solidarity and collective action. And I, I, I think it's particularly important to address uh, and bring in feminist scholarship here um, because feminist gender injustice is among the most uh, prevalent that we all experience and understand. And when I say bring a feminist lens, it's really just paying attention to these problematic power dynamics. Um, so I, um, in 2020, I wrote a book called Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy. And this um, was really a synthesis for me of why we've been so ineffective, so inefficient, and inadequate in our response to the climate crisis. And it's largely because the same kinds of people with the same kinds of training are coming up with the same kinds of ideas, and it, none of them are transformative. Um, so I suggest that not only can we think about how to address the climate crisis and all these other poly crises, but we have to think about um, a, a shift in, in even thinking about universities. And universities, I suggest, are under leveraged resource in society. And I think there's also a risk that by not being transformative enough in our universities, we are reinforcing and perpetuating the problems. So um, I'm uh, a professor in Boston, and with it, one of my students, we wrote a piece that was published in the Boston Globe calling for climate justice to be the mission of higher education. And in Boston is the city in the world that has the most highest density of universities than any other city. And you would think if universities are there, are helping society and the city and the community around them, Boston would be, you know, this great mecca of social justice. It is not. It is a segregated, disparate health disparities, economic racial wealth gap is among the biggest in the country, in the world. And so it, it, that just goes to show that our universities are not necessarily um, contributing in the ways that we might think or the ways they could. If anyone's interested in an academic paper that I've co-authored with six of my students that 
embraces this idea about climate justice in higher education. This is open access. You can uh, take a look. And what I want to uh, encourage everyone to think about is universities as knowledge-based um, institutions. That's often the way we're framed, right? Um, but that there's this connection between knowledge, wealth, and power that universities have gotten um, kind of manipulated into to actually be c contributing to the concentration of wealth and power, um, as well as um, um, kind of gatekeeping the knowledge as well, and in ways that are really not um, helpful for society. So um, when we think about teaching, I encourage us to think about learning, but also unlearning, letting go of the things that we're being taught that actually don't serve us, and there's quite a bit. When you think about research, we need innovation, but we also need exnovation, and that is what the panel on plastics was talking about. How do we so rely on plastics, but why, if plastics and fossil fuels are the biggest challenges facing society, why don't any of our universities have research programs and centers exclusively focused on those big challenges? We don't yet. And the reason I suggest is because of the powerful interests that actually don't want to us to, right? They don't want it, so there's this resistance to the exnovation that we need to focus on. Then in terms of wealth, um, I think it's very important to pay attention to the money flows and the financialization of higher education, the commodification, commercialization, um, and then different ways that universities, that we can engage locally, engage with different kinds of communities and partner with the um, organizations that are trying to exnovate and unlearn for transformative change. So um, one of the challenges, and that maybe this relates to the design mentality, is um, thinking about unlearning is so much of what our educational systems focus on is individualistic, competitive, isolated kind of mindset. Um, and we need to move that away from that toward a more collective connection and relational knowledge, which um, was also talked about earlier in the panel uh, this morning. So um, Sean mentioned Kate Rayworth's work on donut economics. How economics is taught in universities is deceptive. And it is so simplistic, and it's uh, based on neoliberal market-based economics, and it doesn't relate to what's happening in the world, especially with planetary boundaries. So unlearning economics is a huge um, initiative. As I mentioned, exnovation research. Um, fossil fuel phase-out is arguably one of the biggest challenges that, uh, along with plastics, connected to plastics. Um, and. Um, it's been really an intellectual no-fly zone in the research community um, and in academia. And so we need to change that. And there, there have been now some, the EU just funded a project on fossil fuel phase out and there's a few other uh, examples there. So another thing, and we think about knowledge um, and universities and this um, paradigm of very Eurocentric colonial legacy of our universities. Um, Vandana Shiva has suggested and proposed, you know, thinking about grandmother's universities in every community, basically, so that acknowledging that we lose so much of our local knowledge, we lose the knowledge from um, ancestors and elders who, who aren't part of our formal education systems, and that there's so much um, potential for us to reimagine the distribution of universities, even, and like how they are structured. Um, and um, at Harvard University, uh, they just recently, they have a, a, an endowment of $50 billion. Uh, and they just in April got a rich alumni to donate 300 more million, you know, which um, you can wonder why, like to what end. Um, but the president of Harvard said, oh, generosity and loyalty are among the defining characteristics of the alumni. Who, and I am actually a Harvard alum, so I can um, talk about this it, from personal experience as well as um, it, as a critique. But so I ask us, what if universities were teaching a loyalty and a generosity to others, to the land, to the 
Earth to the non-human species to, you know, with that connectivity. Instead, it's so insular. It's, it's, it's telling you, you're part of this club. Keep, let's keep the club going and donate back to the club that you're part of. And from a very early stage in universities, we're encouraging this connection with the institutional loyalty um, that is, I think, a little bit, um, it, it has potential to be harnessed in a different way. So um, I want to end here and just um, quote Vanessa de Oliveira's work where she has said that, you know, we can't actually learn to swim until the water is at our hips. And for many of us in this room, the water isn't yet at our hips. So we can't even imagine, right, like what is coming. And so we go through our days, most of us, many of us, thinking, well, maybe it won't happen. Maybe we'll be okay. Maybe there's a technological fix. Uh, maybe, um, and we can't really learn to swim by um, watching others who've or, who are already there. Um, because you actually have to experience it. So this, this remark is really about kind of a humbleness and a um, um, not, not a pessimistic, I mean, but a, but a reality that I think we have to embrace in, our, in how we're thinking about these big challenges and how we think about the future. The future is now. We don't have time, and we need to be acting in the ways that we want the future to be um, in the ways that we can now. So I'll end here and just say the landscape is changing rapidly and if you play the same game on a landscape that has changed, you know, it's not going to be, the game won't work. And I think many of the things we're doing in our universities and in our um, uh, politics trying to address these problems are completely ineffective and insufficient. Uh, so we really need this transformative lens. So hopefully that sets us up well to hear um, some other great okay. perspectives on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Any immediate questions there? Yes, right over here. If we don't have justice for other nature, and specifically if we don't have justice for other animals, um, just like I said earlier, we have to look at our practice when we're artists and the materials that we use. We also have to look at our practice in universities in terms of how we feed people. I am really appreciative of the generosity in giving us lunch today, but we've just served up cows and we've just served up sheep and we've just served up other animals and we're here talking about earth justice. Yeah. It was vegan. So I think the, a quick response to that, and I think it's something we should continue. It was the vegan. It was vegan. The cows. Were Lunch was vegan. <laughs> Wasn't it? It was vegan. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I think the, uh, what I think this your comment brings up is that we've lost a uh, connection, right, with so much in that many of us don't even think about the food systems. We don't think about our, the um, connection with the land from different agricultural practices. Um, and and our, I, I think the, the, the opportunity is there for us to redefine how we integrate that relational knowledge building and nurture it for care and compassion in, in our university spaces and other spaces as well. So thank you for that important point. Great. Okay. Any further questions at this point? Yes, right at the back. Thanks. Um, thank you. It was really fascinating. I suppose my question is, given all the, the kind of issues that you've highlighted within the university sector, how it's not working, what is the rationale for arguing for reform within the university sector rather than proposing an alternative space where this type of change should happen? Yeah, excellent question. And this is what I've, I've been part of quite a few conversations of the future of the university. And guess where they're happening? In universities, right? So I think this speaks to why we need to um, engage more outside of our uh, campuses, different kinds of partnerships, but also as you 
rightly point out, we have to think more about economic policy and other policies and educational policies, how, how universities are funded. We're so constrained by the funding um, realities uh, that are very political and very, um, in, as, as I pointed out, increasingly reliant on donations from wealthy contributors or corporations, which then dictate and have an influence on what we're doing inside the university. So the, the case is very much to reimagine all of that, right? And, and part of that is engaging in policy and politics and, and distributing the potential of um, higher education in a different way. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Oh, we'll just take one more quickly and then we'll, we'll have to press on. Hang on, it's just coming in now. Uh, microphone. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I wondered if you were familiar with Esperanza Spalding breaking away from Harvard, the musician uh, Esperanza Spalding, because of her uh, initiative to create um, communal uh, services, speaking about what you're talking about now, con connecting Harvard to uh, artist-based work for black creatives, mm -hmm. creatives of color, and also communities that which is, like you said, with Boston, a community that Harvard sits in. Did you have thoughts about that? Because that, that's, and that was just last year, last winter, when she finally resigned. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there's so many examples of amazing initiatives, attempts, right, of individuals. Metaphorical, metaphorical attempts. Yes, metaphorical attempts. Um, and then, without the institutional support, um, and it really embracing, and this, this gets to all kinds of, you know, greenwashing, as was mentioned earlier, um, and universities are all about branding and <coughs> showcasing the cool things they're doing without actually, you know, oftentimes not changing that much what's actually being done. So, so I think this is why, um, I mean, in some way, you know, I follow, I'm in a university and I'm studying universities, so it's like a, similar insular thing, but it, in fact, they repre it represents something bigger, right, in society that is happening in, in or, all kinds of organizations in all kinds of places. So thank you for that. Great. Okay, that's all we have time for just now. Jenny, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Yeah. Thank you all.